Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, The Clinical and Economic Impact of Precision Cancer Medicine. I'm Robert Castellanos of Labrits, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labrits and sponsored by Intermountain Precision Genomics. At Intermountain Precision Genomics, we use a revolutionary method of gene sequencing. Our experts now deliver more precise medicine than ever before and are on the forefront of personalized cancer testing for all types of genetic mutations. Our process is unique because we offer a molecular tumor board review as part of every test. This team approach gives community oncologists confidence in providing the best option for patients. Drug procurement is also available and clinical trial information is included in the results. We are providing these treatments to patients across the nation, giving more people a better quality of life. For more information, please visit intermountainhealthcare.org. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing educational credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the C button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of attaining your credits. I would like to now introduce today's speaker, Lincoln Nadal. Dr. Lincoln Nadal, MD, PhD, is the Executive Director of Precision Medicine and the Precision Genomics at Intermountain Healthcare, an integrated healthcare system located in the Intermountain West. Dr. Nadal completed clinical training in the Medical Oncology Stanford University School of Medicine, where he's still part of the research faculty focusing on cancer genomics and personalized cancer medicine. Dr. Nadal oversees the clinical implementation of genomic cancer medicine across Intermountain's healthcare, 22 hospitals, and 180 physician clinics. In his spare time, he enjoys attending his children's sports events, water sports, fishing, and athletics. I'll now turn it over to the doctor for his presentation. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction, and I appreciate the opportunity today to present um, our experience at Intermountain Healthcare with clinically implementing precision medicine for cancer patients. And I specifically will highlight the clinical impact that precision medicine has had on patients as well as the economic impact. Um, so before I start, I'd just like to uh, highlight the outline of my talk that will include first um, reviewing some of the key principles and challenges in precision medicine. And then I'll highlight uh, how we establish precision medicine within an integrated health delivery system, and then highlight the outcomes that we have seen for patients and conclude with some of our planned future steps. For those attendees who may not be familiar with Intermountain Healthcare, this is a, an integrated health delivery network located in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, best known for uh, implementing best practices and championing um, high quality outcomes. Uh, referrals are received from uh, a nationwide uh, reference uh, pool, and uh, patients uh, include those not only living in Utah, but the entire Intermountain West. I mentioned that it's an integrated healthcare system that consists of approximately 22 hospitals and 180 clinics, uh, including a children's hospital. Intermountain Healthcare is an open system, meaning that um, providers uh, seeing patients at Intermountain Healthcare can be employed or they can be affiliated. Uh, in addition, patients uh, that are seen at Intermountain Healthcare uh, don't necessarily have to have Intermountain Healthcare insurance. Uh, uh, Intermountain Healthcare um, accepts uh, all types of insurance. So I'd like to transition now and talk about some of the primary principles um, and challenges associated with pre precision medicine. Many on the webinar may be familiar that uh, what's uh, outlined here in this schematic is essentially the, um, the underlying principle of precision medicine that includes identifying 
from a cancer cell the genomic alterations that are present, and then uh, selecting the appropriate targeted therapy uh, that would be used to target that specific genomic alteration. Uh, so in any particular patient's tumor, we may find two or three or four uh, actionable mutations that have previously been characterized whose biological relevance is known. Uh, those would then be considered uh, known or clinically actionable variants and could be targeted with currently available therapies, either through on-label use or off-label use or, in some cases, through clinical trials. And that's the question that comes up. Is it really that simple? It sounds straightforward to say we will identify the genes in someone's tumor and then we'll provide them with the appropriate targeted therapy that matches that gene. Uh, of course, the challenge is uh, that nothing's ever quite as easy as we'd like it to be. And some of the principles that challenge the basic premise of precision medicine include uh, tumor heterogeneity. Uh, this paper that was published by Gerlinger and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago was an excellent demonstration of the principle of tumor heterogeneity. They were able to obtain biopsies from multiple different portions of a renal cell carcinoma, as highlighted in the cartoon there. Uh, and then they subsequently performed a genomic analysis from each of these different biopsy locations and found that each different biopsy location gave a different set of genomic alterations identified. So that's worrisome from a precision medicine standpoint because it suggests that if we obtain tissue and a biopsy from one portion of a patient's tumor and identify a list of genomic alterations that could be targeted with drugs, that may not be the same set of genomic alterations identified in a different part of the tumor. So there is intratumoral heterogeneity. In addition, there is intertumoral heterogeneity so that different tumors, even within the same individual, may in fact have different uh, sets of genomic findings as well. And this notion of tumor heterogeneity is um, well received and understood and does present a bit of a challenge for precision medicine. A second challenge is the concept of tumor evolution. Um, this principle uh, is highlighted by the phenomenon where tumors may have an initial set of genomic alterations that are identified in a patient's tumor. However, uh, with the application of treatment, uh, that essentially becomes um, a pressure that then selects for clones that are resistant to that particular treatment. And as highlighted in the schematic, we may uh, be able to put a tumor into remission with certain treatments only to then have it recur and begin growing again. And if we re-biopsy and perform a genomic analysis, we would, teach, we would be able to see that, in fact, the new recurrent tumor is comprised of uh, genomic alterations that are very distinct and different than the original tumor that um, was sequenced. And so this notion of tumor evolution with genomic alterations constantly changing presents a challenge. And a final challenge uh, when considering precision medicine is the sheer number of mutations. As I highlighted on the left, in the pediatric population, the number of mutations identified in any particular tumor is relatively small. For example, in a childhood neuroblastoma, we may only find a dozen mutations. Contrastingly, in an adult lung cancer, for example, non-small cell lung cancer, we may find up to 150 different mutations. And so uh, there is a, a wide variety of mutations that we may identify, and as the number grows larger in adult cancers, the ability to interpret the meaning of each of those mutations and apply the, the finding of each mutation to uh, treatment for the patient becomes increasingly complex. Nevertheless, uh, the principle of precision medicine remains, and the concept is we can take uh, a seemingly homogenous population of patients, as represented on the left in the gray grouping of patients, apply a molecular analysis or genomic analysis and recognize that, in fact, that seemingly homogenous population is actually very heterogeneous. And once we recognize the heterogeneous nature and know what the molecular makeup of that patient's tumor is, then we can apply the appropriate targeted therapy in a precision cancer medicine approach. And that's the approach that we've taken at Intermountain Healthcare. We achieved this initially by establishing a clinical cancer genomics program. Uh, patients uh, were referred to our personalized medicine clinic where they were provided education 
um, and consent forms regarding uh, the application of precision medicine. Ultimately, they then had um, genomic testing of their tumor. Uh, this, each genomic test was then reviewed by a molecular tumor board, and ultimately, um, drug, uh, targeted drug was procured and made available for the patient. And that's um, the program that we uh, initially set up. The workflow that we have established to accomplish this is outlined uh, in this slide, where patients were initially seen on day one, and then over the next several days, uh, our lab would procure the sample uh, from whichever pathology lab it may be located in. Uh, we perform a review and prepare the specimen, and then perform this molecular analysis and uh, bioanalytics function, and ultimately, each case is reviewed by our molecular tumor board, and then results are delivered. And overall, we've now been able to accomplish that in about a 14-day turnaround time. When we first started, we were uh, closer to 25 or 28 days, so we've gained some significant efficiencies. And being able to turn it around in about um, 14 working days um, is uh, clinically impactful for patients and meaningful for providers. Uh, this is another way to think about our workflow from an IT standpoint, um, on the left-hand side is highlighted receiving a, a test order from a provider. Um, and then that goes through um, a series of operations that includes uh, accessioning the specimen, um, generating a run sheet, uh, performing the analysis, all the way down to um, re uh, generating a report and delivering that report to the ordering provider. Um, the partners that have helped us in this include SciApps, who has provided the overarching software platform. Um, and we've built this on uh, the background of Illumina sequencers uh, with analytical and interpretation input services from uh, DNA Nexus and NF1. Our molecular tumor board has been in a very critical aspect of our implementation of precision medicine. Uh, we discovered initially that uh, the, perhaps the hardest part of implementing precision medicine is interpreting genomic results. Uh, we found that our community oncologist colleagues would receive a list of genomic alterations, and very frequently it would frankly read like Greek. Uh, finding a KRAS mutation and a P53 mutation and an FGFR1 alteration and an amplification of CDK4 is um, unfamiliar to most um, providers. So we found that uh, molecular tumor board interpretation uh, that uh, ultimately um, is sent back to the provider and says, uh, here a group of experts has looked at this and would suggest um, targeting variant number one with drug A and variant number two with drug B uh, gives the community provider some confidence uh, in what they're seeing on the report. So we have formed a multi-institutional molecular tumor board that is hosted and anchored by Intermountain Healthcare. And then we uh, invite colleagues from a variety of organizations and institutions across the United States, including colleagues from Stanford University and the Providence Health System and the University of uh, Colorado and other uh, health systems and academic organizations across the country. <clears throat> this uh, entire workflow we built internally at Intermountain Healthcare, and after we began seeing successful outcomes, we resolved to make it available um, to uh, providers outside of Intermountain, both nationally and internationally. This is now accomplished through our website as a not-for-profit health delivery system. Uh, we've made this available through precisioncancer.org, and any provider can log into this website, order testing, um, and then two weeks later, receive and view interactive test results that include the molecular tumor board interpretation and drug procurement services. This is an example of what one of our reports look, looks like, and I wanted to highlight the, the fact that the molecular tumor board interpretation is included in the report function, in the, in the actual report. Uh, you can see uh, highlighted in the green box there where it says molecular tumor board interpretation uh, is a summary of the findings. And in the uh, uh, case of this example, an EGFR uh, gene mutation was identified. And so the molecular tumor board would say we suggest um, targeting EGFR first with either one of those drugs. 
Uh, and then those drugs could even be ordered by clicking on the order button, and the local Intermountain team would then engage with that patient's insurance provider to help procure and have the drug shipped to the, to the patient, uh, which relieves an enormous pressure from local community treating oncologists. <clears throat> So um, we also uh, perform all of the reporting functions within this same web, web portal. Our molecular tumor board reviews um, test reports in this portal, um, approves them, and ultimately uh, final sign-out occurs in this portal, and the results are delivered through this um, same web portal. As we have built this program and um, testing service, in our uh, CLIA and CAP accredited uh, clinical laboratory, we have asked an initial question. We've wondered, what kind of clinical impact does this type of testing subsequently have on patients? Um, we think that it's terrific to implement new technology for patients, but it's not in the patient's or provider or payer's best interest if those tests and those technologies don't in some meaningful way impact the management of that patient. So that was the first question we asked, and we're surprised to find that about half the time, a patient's management was changed upon receipt of the genomic test result. We found that patients uh, are often uh, uh, changed to receive a different treatment or are referred to clinical trials. So that's interesting to see. Um, some colleagues in the pediatric se setting have found uh, something similar where they implemented whole exome sequencing of uh, pediatric tumors, and as published by Harrison colleagues in JAMA Oncology earlier in 2016, uh, they found that um, delivery of genomic testing results also uh, facilitated a change in management for those patients um, approximately 30% of the time. So again, a significant uh, change in management with the addition of genomic testing, which, is, which suggests that providers, in fact, do use this information. The next question we asked, and I highlighted at the beginning that I would comment on the clinical outcomes and the economic outcomes, and, and in order to uh, evaluate those outcomes for patients, we set up the study that is outlined in this slide. And for those that are interested, um, these findings, including um, the design and setup of this study, uh, was recently published in the Journal of Oncology Practice uh, the first week of September 2016 um, with Haslam as first author, for those who are interested, and Nadal as last author. Uh, but what we did was look at patients who had received genomic testing and were found to have an actionable mutation. And we found that, um, and then received targeted drug, and we found there were 61 patients um, who uh, fit those criteria. And we wanted to look and see um, how many patients also within the Intermountain Healthcare System uh, that had not received uh, genomic testing and a targeted therapy, and what kinds of outcomes those two different cohorts had. So uh, we matched them up very carefully and uh, the matching criteria include that patients had to have the same diagnosis, age, gender, and number of previous treatment lines in order to be considered a case and control match. In total, when we looked at this, we found 36 patients who had the same age, gender, diagnosis, and a number of previous treatments for their cancer as a control case did. So we looked at uh, the precision medicine cohort of patients who had received genomic testing and a targeted therapy compared to the control cohort of patients who had not received genomic testing or a targeted therapy but had gone on to receive uh, the next line of standard care. And then we assessed those uh, patients for both progression-free survival and the cost of care. And we found that in the precision medicine cohort, their progression-free survival was approximately 23 weeks, whereas in the control cohort of patients receiving standard therapy, the progression-free survival was approximately 12 weeks, about half of that. So we found a significant extension of progression-free survival for patients who received a genomic analysis and uh, targeted therapy, and the p-value was highly significant. The survival curves are highlighted in this um, slide, and uh, I think um, 
are significant in the um, gap that exists between the targeted therapy cohort and the standard therapy cohort. The next question we asked was uh, re relative to the cost of care. We wondered how much it costs to implement a precision medicine approach. So we looked at the total costs per patient, we looked at the drug cost per patient, and we looked at the total, total costs on a per survival week basis. And we found that um, the, 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 the primary point here uh, is in that bottom column where on a per survival week of basis, the cost of the total cost of care, including the cost of drug, the cost of clinic visits, the cost of any uh, visit to an emergency room or admission to an inpatient setting, all healthcare associated costs were $4,600 per patient per week uh, in the precision medicine cohort um, and $5,000 per patient per week in the control cohort. Uh, and the p-value uh, was, was not significant, suggesting that while there's a trend towards it actually being less expensive to implement a precision medicine treatment approach, at the very least, it does not cost any more, and the costs are essentially equivalent between those two cohorts, whether you use a standard uh, chemotherapy or supportive care regimen versus a precision medicine approach. Our survival findings are similar to what was also recently reported um, by Roselle Kurzrock's group at UCSD, where they performed an enormous uh, meta-analysis of 300, nearly 350 phase one and phase two clinical trials where a precision targeted medicine was matched to a genomic alteration. And over 13,000 patients were evaluated and compared to patients who received standard therapy not based on um, uh, a genomic analysis or targeted therapy. And their findings uh, were almost identical to what we discovered in, a, in our own cohort, uh, which is that the targeted or precision medicine group had a progression-free survival of um, 5.7 months, which is very close to the 23 weeks that we saw, whereas the control cohort um, progression-free survival was about three months, or very close to the 12 weeks that we saw. Um, so that was uh, very interesting uh, for us to see that uh, these findings from a large meta-analysis were very similar to the findings we had in our uh, cohort of patients. So um, I think it's interesting and instructive to talk about um, cohorts of patients, but I also think that often um, providers, um, scientists, and others are interested in individual cases. I just presented, you know, 72 total patients in their collective outcomes, but what about single individuals? And I wanted to just share uh, a slide or two about some specific patients and how they did. Highlighted in this slide is a gentleman that was part of the cohort that I just mentioned in our study. He was a 56-year-old gentleman who had um, an alteration in a gene called BRAF. It was not the classical V600E mutation uh, commonly seen in melanoma, but nevertheless was an activating mutation and we were able to obtain a MEK inhibitor for this patient in the form of a drug called Mechanist or Trametinib. And after uh, two months, he had a dramatic clinical response as highlighted in this PET-CT scan from before in the panels on the left where there is disease outlined by the dashed yellow line, both in the mediastinum uh, as well as in the supraclavicular region, uh, compared to after two months of treatment where there has been a dramatic response with um, shrinkage in both the mediastinum and the supraclavicular region. In total, this patient was able to stay on the targeted therapy for 15 months before his disease did eventually become refractory, presumably through tumor evolutionary forces, and uh, ultimately the patient uh, succumbed to disease and passed away. Nevertheless, he was able to have a significant uh, and prolonged response when we otherwise would not have predicted so for a patient who otherwise had refractory uh, metastatic lung cancer. So that was an excellent outcome for him. We uh, had another case of a gentleman in his 40s with advanced colon cancer who had progressed through um, multiple treatments and essentially the entire standard of care. And the genomic analysis identified an amplification of HER2 or ERBB2. We wondered about the amplification 
amplitude of that amplification. And so as something of a research um, project, we performed a digital PCR experiment and discovered that in his tumor, the copy number of HER2 was nearly 30, which is startling and is really high. In fact, it's the highest HER2 copy number I've ever seen. Um, and it was uh, interesting for us and kind of exciting because we wondered if this patient might, in fact, respond to anti-HER2 therapy. We uh, were able to get him some anti-HER2 therapy, and in this slide, what is highlighted is um, his, uh, the status of his disease, um, first while on chemotherapy, and as you can see, starting from the left and moving to the right, those two dark lesions in the middle of the liver that are outlined by the dashed yellow line actually grew bigger while on chemotherapy. Uh, then the addition of TDM1, an anti-HER2 uh, antibody drug conjugate, was applied, and these two um, liver uh, tumors began to shrink. And after um, three doses, in fact, we had a hard time even identifying them on CT scan. This was a very rapid response occurring after approximately two months. In total, the patient was on the drug for approximately 18 months and did extraordinarily well, and his children were thrilled. Unfortunately, he too experienced um, an evolution of his tumor and it ultimately became refractory, but he did have that nice prolonged response. This is the final case that I'll share. It's um, a, a 52-year-old woman with advanced melanoma who had progressed through immunotherapy and didn't have uh, a BRAF mutation or other actual mutations um, that would represent an indication for standard therapy. But when we performed this expanded genomic analysis, uh, using our um, test that we developed, uh, we found a CKIT alteration, which can be targeted with a drug called Gleevec or Imatinib. We were able to get that drug for the patient, and she, again, had a very rapid response, as identified by or represented by the tumor um, on the left, uh, uh, encircled by the dashed red line, and three months later, it had shrunk from eight centimeters down to two centimeters, as represented in the figure on the right, circled by the dashed red line. Uh, this patient uh, ultimately uh, enjoyed a response for over a year, uh, but had disease uh, in her brain, uh, and ultimately she succumbed, but again, uh, did very well. Um, uh, I want to share one final case that highlights a very important point and something that we've discovered as we've embarked on this precision medicine approach. Uh, and it's highlighted by this patient um, with advanced cholangiocarcinoma. He had progressed through multiple treatments, and we found that his tumor harbored a mutation in a gene called FGFR2. Um, what was startling is that as we d uh, dug further into his case, we found that, in fact, he uh, had other cases of this type of disease in his family. And uh, the pedigree highlighted on this screen shows that um, his mother and maternal grandfather were both um, affected by pancreatic cancer, and his sister was diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma just like him six weeks after he was diagnosed. Uh, what's not represented here is that another brother, um, subject 3-1, uh, subsequently, uh, approximately a year after this patient's diagnosis, was uh, diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma as well. Um, and so uh, you can quickly see that uh, there is some indication this might, in fact, be an inherited um, cancer syndrome. Um, and, in, and it turns out that that's what it appears. We've done some additional research, uh, and it appears that that family has an inherited cancer syndrome. I bring that up uh, to point out that as we perform these genomic analyses on a large number of genes, inevitably we identify alterations in genes that suggest uh, patients may, in fact, have inherited uh, a mutant allele from a parent. So in total, for example, we have found two individuals that harbor germline inherited BRCA mutations, one in breast and one in ovarian. Then I mentioned the new familial case of cholangiocarcinoma, uh, and what I'm not highlighting is we have found some other inherited forms of melanoma. And so the, the principle that is important to keep in mind is when implementing precision medicine for cancer patients and sequencing tumors, invariably um, we will detect germline alterations, and we must recognize that cancer genomics do reflect the germline state. 
Uh, and so this slide just represents how that patient with cholangiocarcinoma ultimately did. We were able to get a target of therapy for him. He had a prolonged response to an FGFR target of therapy and did very well for nearly two years. So that is uh, essentially a summary of how we have implemented precision medicine in Intermountain Healthcare, the workflow that we've established, and the excellent outcomes that patients have experienced uh, um, compared to standard control treatments uh, for advanced refractory cancers. Um, I'd like to transition a bit now, and uh, for those that are interested, I'm going to share a little bit of our future plans, <clears throat> including uh, the establishment of a genomics data sharing consortium, um, a project that we're undertaking uh, with our biorepository, including the establishment of a high throughput sequencing facility, and a recent uh, agreement that we have formed with the Stanford Genome Technology Center. I mentioned the genomics data sharing consortium. This is an effort established by Intermountain Healthcare, um, Providence Health and Services, and Stanford Hospitals and Clinics. And as I spoke with colleagues about Providence and Stanford, we all quickly came to the same conclusion that implementing precision medicine can help patients, but occasionally we identify genomic variants that are rare and we're unsure of what to do with those. And populations of patients at a single institution um, are insufficiently large to draw any conclusions about how to treat those patients or what outcomes they might have. However, we thought if we could share our data amongst each other, then if I find a patient with an ovarian cancer, for example, that has a rare mutation that I haven't seen before, maybe I won't know how to treat that patient. But if I can see the data and outcomes from patients at Stanford or the large Providence system, perhaps they will have a patient that had the same mutation and receive treatment, and I'll know what their outcome was like, and that will make me smarter for treating my patient. So um, we are now uh, sharing data between these three institutions, and it includes data points like age and diagnosis and genomics, genomic variants and treatments, et cetera. And the data that is shared is also the data that you can view um, from other institutions. This is called the Oncology Precision Network, it's been a very exciting effort. In addition to these three founding institutions, we have numerous additional institutions that are joining as we speak, including uh, integrated health delivery networks across the country and several academic institutions that are eager to join and share data so that uh, their own single institution set of data can be enlarged by seeing other institutions' data. This oncology precision network was highlighted by Vice President Biden at his cancer moonshot um, uh, event in June at Brown University. Uh, the way this works is that as um, institutions generate genomic data, all of that is consolidated through our SIOPS um, software platform and is aggregated into one common database. Um, and then we can run analytics and ask powerful questions, such as, um, show me all of the patients that have, as represented in this slide, a particular tumor type, or maybe I would like to search the common database by genes or specific alterations, and I can see what types of treatments those patients had. And so this oncology precision network, or OPEN, uh, is becoming a very powerful resource to understand what types of alterations exist amongst patients um, across the country, and what types of treatments are yielding responses. Uh, if there's anyone uh, on the webinar that would be interested in learning more or even uh, possibly um, contributing data to the Oncology Precision Network, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly, and I can help answer any questions. Uh, I'll transition now to a second project that we are working on, the Intermountain Healthcare Biorepository consists of approximately 4 million clinical specimens that have been collected since 1975. Uh, these samples are archived in FFPE blocks over the last 40 years. And what's extraordinarily unusual about these is that we have clinical, digital, and searchable outcomes um, in our electronic data warehouse over about 30 years. 
what that practically means is I can walk into the biorepository and pictured there on the slide is an actual uh, picture of our biorepository. I can open one of those boxes, pull out a shelf, pull a specimen out of it, and then I could uh, go into the electronic data warehouse and find all of the digital outcomes associated with that specimen over a 30-year period. It represents an extraordinarily powerful opportunity um, to ask important questions. In order to unlock the secrets hidden away in those specimens from the last 40 years, we are building a high-throughput sequencing facility on the platform of an X10 Illumina HiSeq um, instrument uh, that will allow us the capacity to do up to 18,000 genomes a year. Um, and it will enable the uh, sequencing of our biorepository for novel discovery. And as we take those genomic alterations and combine them with the clinical outcomes for each sample, uh, we'll be able to discover, for example, the molecular fingerprint that may predict for recurrence in colon cancer or predictors of response to certain treatments in breast cancer, and on and on the list of possibilities and questions goes. Finally, and in conclusion, we uh, have begun to recognize that uh, one of our great strengths is the delivery of medicine in a clinical setting. Uh, to become increasingly excellent in that pursuit, we have recognized the need to develop new and uh, adapt novel technologies. In order to accomplish that, we have recently formed a partnership with the Stanford Genome Technology Center, where we will uh, be jointly developing technologies that have particular clinical application, uh, and then clinically implementing those, including molecular diagnostics, uh, wearable sensor devices, and others. So in summary, what we have found in our efforts at Intermountain Healthcare and our precision medicine program is that, in fact, precision cancer medicine is feasible. And uh, in a, as we applied it, we found that there is actually an improved progression-free survival. Uh, so this is significant for patients. It represents another treatment option for providers um, and patients alike, uh, so that when patients become uh, refractory or if they are not candidates for standard therapy or standard therapy hasn't worked, that providing a precision medicine approach uh, remains an outstanding uh, and viable option for them. Additional clinical trials are currently underway, including the National Cancer Institute MATCH trial and the TAPER trial uh, sponsored by ASCO, both of which are evaluating the use of precision targeted therapies based on genomic testing results. Uh, to determine whether precision cancer medicine is uh, indeed associated with superior outcomes as the uh, UCSD study has identified and our study as well. Um, additional summary points from our experience include uh, that healthcare associated costs uh, for precision medicine patients is not higher than standard um, chemotherapy approaches. We've also found that pediatric tumors higher high, uh, harbor uh, high numbers of clinically um, actionable variants. And finally, that the somatic um, sequence, uh, sequencing of, for somatic alterations uh, invariably identifies uh, germline alterations. So I would just like to pause and acknowledge the uh, very big team uh, comprised of uh, outstanding and capable individuals who've made all of this work possible. And that, that includes the list of individuals there from our Intermount Precision Genomics team, um, as well as colleagues from Stanford University. Um, some funding has come from the NCI and from ASCO, uh, for which we are grateful. And with that, I think we have a few minutes left to take some questions, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much, Doctor, for that amazing and informative presentation. Before we get started on our question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And again, we're going to try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Our first question is, is it practical to have molecular board to review each report? And how often does the molecular board um, meet to do this? 
That is an outstanding question. It, um, having a live molecular tumor board review every single case is very powerful, but as the questioner points out, it's also not scalable. It quickly becomes a bottleneck as volumes increase, and we've actually already begun to experience that. So in the short term, we're overcoming this bottleneck and scaling challenge by uh, increasing the numbers of members of our molecular tumor board so that we can meet more frequently. And currently, we're meeting twice weekly to review all of the cases, and we're able to keep up with the volumes that way. In the long run, we are leveraging um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to learn from what our past um, molecular tumor board interpretations have suggested and then apply that to the future. Uh, so excellent question. We uh, recognize the impracticalities of a live molecular tumor board as volume scale to thousands or tens of thousands of patients, and we have solutions that are in the works that we anticipate will be uh, successful. Thank you for the question. And our next question is, how do you address the intratumor heterogeneity in, in your analysis? It's an excellent question. And we view intratumoral heterogeneity as an opportunity for patients. Uh, so we obtain a biopsy of a tumor, like everyone, and um, uh, we perform the sequencing. And if we identify an actionable mutation, then we'll provide targeted therapy based on that uh, actionable mutation or set of mutations. Then if the patient um, uh, ultimately becomes refractory after a period of time, then we often will repeat the biopsy knowing that either tumor evolution has yielded new alterations or um, biopsy from that same tumor but in a slightly different location may yield other uh, actionable mutations that we can target with different drugs. So we don't believe it's possible to address every single alteration harbored in every tumor from the outset. However, by taking different biopsies at different points in time, you can, in fact, uh, identify different actual mutations that add to the list of treatment options for that particular patient. Great question. Thank you. And have you examined any disparities in access to precision cancer medicine in lower SES populations and Medicare patients? Um, we haven't yet discovered um, geographical uh, disparities in access to drug, but there are uh, disparities amongst different payers. Some payers more readily approve targeted therapies based on um, precision genomic testing, uh, whereas um, other payers are very slow or, or, frankly, reject those requests, and we have to go through an appeals process. We've also found that um, payers are, uh, I think, becoming increasingly educated in understanding of this approach, and we're seeing increasingly uh, frequent approvals uh, for therapies, uh, which is encouraging. So that, that's a great question. I'm glad that was asked. And are you exploring liquid biopsies in addition to solid tumor biopsies? Liquid biopsy is an exciting and potentially transformative uh, technology in cancer. We, like others, are exploring the applications of liquid biopsy. Uh, we're doing that in uh, the research setting currently with patient samples and are um, uh, evaluating uh, the application and the appropriate applications. Some of the immediate applications that are most obvious that uh, our patients will begin experiencing very soon include uh, liquid biopsy for monitoring response to therapy. Uh, we are finding that um, tracking the uh, abundance of certain alterations in the uh, circulating uh, tumor DNA fraction corresponds to response to treatment. And as we uh, verify that's true, we'll be able to delay for uh, CT scanning, for example. If, if we see that a patient is responding based on declining fractions of, of molecular variants in the peripheral blood, then um, we can have confidence in delaying a CT scan because we know they're doing well, they're responding. Additional applications for liquid biopsy um, that we're exploring, and others uh, are aware of this as well, include um, the use of liquid biopsy for monitoring um, and, and surveillance. So if a patient is in 
a remission, for example, can we use liquid biopsy to monitor for disease recurrence? Uh, and then ultimately, uh, we anticipate being able to use liquid biopsy to uh, in undiagnosed patients, so to diagnose disease at earlier and earlier stages of, uh, of disease, uh, which is a, a exciting and perhaps the most revolutionary application of liquid biopsy technology. Uh, great question. And our next question is, somatic alteration reflects germline alterations. By germline, do you mean heredity? Yeah, great question. Um, of course, the tumor uh, has uh, um, or harbors um, alterations that have occurred uh, somatically, uh, meaning, you know, at some point during the patient's life. Um, and by germline, uh, exactly as the questioner posed, I'm uh, referencing inherited uh, DNA. So uh, the germline DNA is, uh, uh, what I mean by that is uh, the, the copies of the chromosomes and genes that the patient may have inherited from their um, parents um, and has been uh, present with them from birth and is also uh, the same DNA they would pass on to their children, for example. Good question. My next question in here is, um, some cancers are caused by viruses. Would that be detected by genetic analysis? Yeah, you know, this, this is an astute question. This is a great question. Um, there are some cancers that are caused by viruses. What's, uh, an example would be um, cervical cancer and uh, the human papillomavirus. Um, HPV is also uh, considered the causative agent in some forms of head and neck cancer. And in fact, these two examples are the exact reason there's a strong push now for um, HPV vaccinations in children of certain ages. Um, but we're finding that some of these virally driven cancers um, respond uh, extremely well to certain treatments. Those can be, uh, the, the virally driven cancers can sometimes be identified by genomic analysis. Many of the genomic tests that are on the market now um, interrogate a panel of genes. The Intermountain Precision Genomics um, ICG-100 test is an example of that where we test a panel of genes. Uh, testing a panel of genes doesn't necessarily uh, detect uh, inserted genomic DNA, uh, nor do other um, similar tests that are on the market. Uh, so I guess the short answer is sometimes we can identify um, virally driven uh, tumors based on genomic analysis, uh, but not every time. All right here, um, and our next question is, despite many cutting edge technologies, why do people still die of cancers? Is it probable or possible that environmental factors distribute um, or disrupt early diagnostics and treatment? Yeah, great question. Undoubtedly, there are environmental factors that play significant roles in cancer, uh, not only in their cause, but in delaying their um, diagnosis. Uh, you know, the best examples of the causative environmental factors, of course, include cigarette smoking and, um, uh, you know, exposure, repeated and prolonged uh, sun exposure, you know, contributing to melanoma um, and other uh, hazardous environmental agents, um, contributing to bladder cancers and, and other uh, cancers. Um, in terms of whether uh, environmental agents uh, directly lead to delayed diagnosis, is, is difficult to determine. Um, but it's clear that our precision medicine technologies um, are exciting in yielding new treatment options. Uh, but just as the questioner pointed out, uh, they are not necessarily resulting in uh, new cures that we weren't seeing before. Uh, to date, we've primarily used precision medicine approaches in patients with advanced or refractory cancers. Um, and while we're seeing a prolongation of life in those patients, uh, we're not seeing cures. And what we think that means is uh, we might be on the verge of, of turning cancer into a chronic disease, um, which would be excellent for patients, given that in the past, patients uh, diagnosed with cancer too frequently um, have had their disease advance and take their lives in a matter of months. And if we could change that narrative so that patients are living uh, years or decades with their disease, that would be exciting. That's, of course, what we've seen with diabetes or heart disease. We don't necessarily cure patients of their diabetes. We don't cure patients of their, of their heart disease. 
but we have treatments in place where they can live normal lives uh, for prolonged periods um, with, the, with their chronic conditions. Good question. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. And what patient population do you treat? Um, I myself have been uh, treating patients with uh, advanced refractory cancers looking for, just as uh, I've been talking about in this uh, presentation, looking for uh, genomic uh, actionable alterations and providing targeted therapies. Um, historically, my focus has been patients with gastrointestinal malignancies. At Intermountain Healthcare, uh, we've been treating all uh, facets of patients. We've primarily focused our precision medicine efforts on patients with solid tumors, but we treat patients uh, with both solid and uh, liquid tumors, including, including with uh, lymphomas and leukemias. Good question. All right here. And it looks like a final question that we have time for today is, uh, will patient insurance cover the cost of genomic testing? We have found that insurance is covering this, and uh, different payers cover at different uh, levels and different rates. Um, our approach at Intermountain Healthcare as a not-for-profit organization has been to um, work directly with payers um, so that patients are not uh, uh, experiencing out-of-pocket expenses. And that's been very successful, and we're proud to say that we don't have patients experiencing um, out-of-pocket expenses when this type of testing is performed. Um, we anticipate that this will continue to be the case, and uh, we're excited that we uh, are able to offer that to patients. Awesome. Thank you. And do you have any closing remarks for today's presentation? Well, I appreciate the opportunity, and for those who tuned in, thank you. I know that uh, everyone has busy schedules, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share with others the experience that we've had as we've tried to help patients by uh, taking uh, novel and innovative approaches to treating cancer. Our hope is that in the future we'll continue to find uh, cancer treatments that are effective uh, and yield prolonged survivals and maybe cures um, while not increasing uh, the cost of health care in this country. Uh, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to present. Thank you for your attention. I thank you. And I'd like to thank the doctor again uh, for his wonderful presentation. I'd also like to thank the audience for your outstanding questions. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Intermountain Precision Genomics, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.